Hello and welcome to this video on Melinda Bobis's Locust Girl, a love song. In this video, I will introduce you to the author herself and to some core topics of the novel, most notably its connection to Filipino poetry, its generic affiliations and its religious undertones. Melinda Bobis is a Filipino-Australian writer and performer who grew up in the Philippines at the foot of an active volcano, which figures prominently in her writing and performance. Whether we can detect its influence in Locust Girl as well, we will perhaps discover during our discussions, either in class or perhaps in the comments. Bobis came to Australia in 1991 on a study grant after teaching literature and English in the Philippines for 10 years. Following her completion of a doctorate of creative arts, she taught creative writing at the University of Wollongong for more than 20 years. She continues to dream new stories in Canberra. Bobus writes in both Bicol and English. All her writing combines the traditions of her land of birth, the Philippines, and the experiences she has made as an immigrant in Australia. Locust Girl, published in 2015, is her most recent novel, preceded by Fish Hair Woman and The Solemn Lantern Maker. Her most recent publication is a poetry collection entitled Accidents of Composition. Her interest in poetry is also visible in her novel writing, perhaps particularly so in Locust Girl, which does, after all, carry the subtitle A Love Song, and contains numerous lyric-like passages. Interestingly, Bobus explicitly connects her poetry to her Filipino heritage. In an interview, Bobus says on the topic, As a Filipino-Australian writer now, I regard poetry as a way of being, a way of breathing together. It is auditory art as much as it is literature that is not exclusive, but shared among the community. I grew up in the Bicol region in the Philippines, listening on the radio to the Tixikan, an oral poetry joust that used to be done in the public park. Some say the Tixik originally meant a toast, a Bicol poetic form of three to four rhyming lines, extemporaneously rendered at drinking sessions or community get-togethers under the full moon, or in a courtship conversation between young men and women. Nowadays it's used to praise, critique, have fun, or have a contest of ideas. Praise and critique can certainly be considered prominent features of Low Cost Girl, seeing as it both celebrates love and belonging, as well as criticizes a number of current issues, most notably the treatment of refugees in Western countries. At the very start, Amidea, later the eponymous Low Cost Girl, lives together with her father, Abarama, in a camp very reminiscent of the refugee camps currently all too present all around the world. The encampment is bombed and Amidea retreats into the earth, where she sleeps for ten years. She wakes, still a nine-year-old girl, at least in appearance, with a locust embedded in her forehead and very little memory of what happened before. The novel follows her on her journey through the desert. There she meets a variety of different people, all stranded in the inhospitable landscape and separated by a border from the more prosperous five kingdoms. Eventually, Amidea manages to cross the border herself, and she experiences the hypocrisies and dangers of the kingdoms. As already alluded to before, there are many connections between a Filipino song tradition from the Bicol region where Bobus grew up and Locust Girl. Bobus's book can be considered not only a novel, but also poetry or song, a literal love song, perhaps, and the novel's structure seems to support this idea. The novel is split into three parts, Locust Girl, Singing, and Love. All three parts use different little vignettes to separate individual paragraphs that are usually one to two pages long. Locust Girl uses a star, Singing uses a musical note, and Love uses a tree, perhaps signifying something like cross-species love as well. The very last page unites all three vignettes, thus suggesting a sort of synthesis of the three parts, similarly to perhaps three parts of a musical composition, which is then woven together in the final part. But there are also more obvious indications of the novel's song-like nature, namely the various stanzas of poetry or lyrics that interrupt the narrative frequently. Some of them are attributed to the locust on Emadea's forehead, while others are sung by the characters she meets on her journey, and yet others are part of the Five Kingdoms' propaganda designed to keep the so-called oasis, people in the desert, probably meant to represent refugees, out. 
The Five Kingdoms clearly acknowledge the power of such songs and actively warn against singing that is not sanctioned by the Minister of Mouths, who is in charge of both propaganda and the distribution of rations to those outside the kingdoms. No one should look, no one should walk beyond the horizon. This simple couplet, for example, set apart from the main text through use of italics, takes on an almost refrain-like quality in its repetitions. It is part of the Five Kingdoms propaganda and represents an effort to keep the wasters ignorant of previous atrocities against them and also keep them from moving elsewhere, from traveling, which seems to be interpreted as a danger to the Five Kingdoms explicitly because it is connected to movement towards the border. Viewed as a whole, Locust Girl can also be interpreted as a song of protest and of witness with regards to the way the Five Kingdoms treat those on the outside while portraying themselves as sort of saviour figures. Indeed, the songs Amidea, or rather her Locust, sings are seen as a threat within the novel as well, since they explicitly counteract the propaganda songs. Your own story is yours, tell it. Your own song is yours, sing it. Sing how lovely, how deadly is your dream of the border. Not only does the Locust song refer to the reclaiming of rhetorical sovereignty that is the right to tell one's own story, but it also highlights its ties to migratory movements towards the border, inspired by hope for a better future and made potentially deadly by the Five Kingdoms' efforts to keep wasters, or perhaps refugees, as we might rightfully call them, out. Despite such grim content, the novel's subtitle, A Love Song, is also justified, as along the way, Amadea's songs, or rather more often the songs of the locust embedded in her skin or those she encounters, are testament to the love felt towards various people, and also the various people that Amadea uh, encounters on her journey, starting with her father and then Binabe, who is the first person she encounters after her ten years' sleep. Even after one of the novel's most gruesome events, the bombing of a wedding, there is a love song which rose from the fires. Beloved, forgive me, love is clumsy because it has so many hands. It has so many hands. The love song element, though at first somewhat surprising, makes sense then after some further analysis, but song is obviously not the novel's only genre. It is, after all, also a novel if nothing else. Another prompt for vivid discussions, then, is Locust Girl's fluidity when it comes to generic belongings. The first class in which I read this novel had the genre dystopia in the title already, so the students were primed to read Locust Girl on Leather Lens. And indeed, the dystopic elements are hard to miss. The aforementioned dire conditions that the people outside of the Five Kingdoms suffer from, living in an inhospitable desert with very little access to food or water, are dystopian both in their quality and in their function, since they serve to warn contemporary readers of impending climate catastrophe. The Five Kingdoms likewise stand for present-day responses to climate change by Western nations, heightened to their dystopian extremes. The people living in the poorest regions of the land, suffering the most from worsening climate conditions, are represented by the Five Kingdoms as the so-called wasters, the ones who cannot manage the Earth's resources responsibly, and thus have to be managed themselves by the so-called carers. This is not only reminiscent of colonial discourse, after all, Australia was deemed terra nullius, no man's land, based on the assumption that Aboriginal people were not using the land in a way that was considered proper, but it also reflects how Western nations increasingly shift blame to nations such as China or India, and their rise to industrial superpowers, all the while continuing to pollute themselves and dumping their trash on poorer, non-Western nations. There are, however, also other generic elements that do not necessarily fit the dystopian genre. Amidea's Locust, for example, is introduced fairly casually as a thing that just happened. During the girl's ten years' sleep, the Locust simply got embedded in her forehead, as if that was just a thing that sometimes happened. Other people in the novel do marvel at the sight and almost seem to worship the Locust, or at least its songs, but the narrative itself does not present this as something that ought to be impossible, which marks a certain proximity to the genre of magical realism. 
It could also be seen as a fantasy element, which would be in line with some other similarities to that particular genre. Amadea's journey itself is close to that great staple of fantasy literature, The Quest Journey. The Five Kingdoms also plays the story in a secondary world with a fantasy-like setting. After all, kingdoms are a very important feature of at least some fantasy literature. The very delocalization of the tale, nothing is identifiably Australian nor anything else, also almost lends Locust Girl a fairy tale-like, to borrow my colleague Lucas Matala's term for this, vibe. This is of course further heightened by the subtitle to the first part of the novel, which simply reads Once Upon a Time, and thus indicates the start of a fairy tale. The last aspect of this very short introduction to Locust Girl is its religious undertones. Amadea's name is reminiscent of the Latin Amadea, beloved by God, though it is changed from the quote-unquote European version, if you will. Her father's name, Abarama, too, seems to hark back to quite literally Abrahamic religions, as it sounds very similar to the biblical name Abraham. Amidea can also be seen as a messianic figure, as the narrative culminates in her sacrifice. Consider this quote. My body grew, pushed to accommodate all voices from all sides of the border, both desert and green haven and I couldn't contain them. I couldn't bear the strain. I burst and caught fire. The sacrifice is the direct result of Amidea's collection of everyone's stories throughout her journey, her act of love and remembering. I saw them watch my charred remains. I saw their horror, their fascination. They felt their bodies, safe. They queried their neighbors, safe. Then the trees, safe. I saw their relief. The fire had claimed only one body. Amidea's death provides relief to the Five Kingdoms' inhabitants, as her sacrifice makes them feel safe once more. The danger represented by her and the Wasters remains repressed. But Amidea's death is not permanent. She emerges from the fire still singing, perhaps restoring. Interestingly, the story ends with an almost ominous undertone as Amidea says, It's early days, but already I feel the urge to feed. I know our nature, I know our history, how we plague, how we love. This refers to the locusts' reputation as a dangerous, thoughtless swarm and to the threat they pose to agriculture. Together with the use of the word plague, often also referring to Amidea with the locusts still embedded in her forehead, this strongly calls to mind the biblical plagues, one of which was a swarm of locusts invading Egypt. Perhaps it is a warning of what is to come to the five kingdoms as punishment for their treatment of those outside the borders. The locust as a migratory animal, both threat and blessing in Locust Girl, will accompany us in the next video as well, in which I will discuss multi-species migration. But for now, I hope that this little introduction has given you some ideas of what can be discussed with Melinda Bobis's Locust Girl, and perhaps has inspired you to make your own analyses of the novel. <laughs>